Right, uh, let's crack on. So, hello again and welcome for what could be the last time, the, the eighth of these eight episodes that I had lined up to, you know, begin to try to um, explain to you or help you understand the world of finance and what's available to you as a retailer, as an individual investor. So just some disclaimers before we proceed. This is not financial advice. It's only my opinions and I'm quite liberal with them. Uh, this is uh, for educational purposes only. Uh, any, you know, brands or names or tickers I take is just because of the easiest examples that come to my mind. Uh, and content is being recorded so that it can be uploaded to YouTube at a later time, which most of you might actually end up watching on YouTube anyways. So uh, today is the last of them. And the point of today's episode is not to fear a crash because there's always going to be a crash. So, I mean, you know, we, we've discussed the need to invest. We've discussed what happens once you click the buy and the sell button on a, on a stock or an ETF or a fund even. Uh, we've discussed about indexes, which, you know, track certain markets, certain sectors, things like that. And funds, which consequently track indexes or, or you know, don't, whatever you prefer. Uh, we spoke about derivatives in episode six, as well as there was a 6A, which is like an annex, uh, which went further into explaining some concepts that I may have skimmed over in the derivatives episode. So get that a go if you want to learn a bit more about margin, leverage, uh, options, futures, and CFDs. Uh, last time, which was yesterday, we spoke about, you know, actually building a portfolio or thinking about how you want to go about uh, building your own portfolio. Of course, it's very subjective, how much risk you want to take, what instruments are available, how much to allocate to each one, depending on what you want to try to achieve, what goals you have, things like that. And today, I'm just going to tell you about uh, market crashes. Oh, right. Um, there we go. Okay, it works. Yes. So my sorry, my buttons weren't uh, weren't responding. Anyway, so contrary to popular belief, stocks don't always go up. So there will always be a crash. You know, this can happen if there's uh, super intensive trading and there are too many middlemen trying to make a profit, you know, so you buy uh, a share of Tesla and you try to sell it and, you and it keeps going up and up and up and up as people uh, hold the, what they have to, you know, to, uh, to, to in, in the hopes that it appreciates a lot. Uh, and then, you know, eventually somebody will start, more people will start selling than buying. And then you have a little dip, could be 10%, could be 5%, could be 1%, could be 50%. I think the market in March of 2020 was about 40% on average, or the S&P was 40%. Uh, some went, you know, cruise liners went down like 60, 70, 80%. Uh, so it's, it's always, there's always going to be something that happens around that. And there's, of course, uh, heavy speculation. So people, uh, electric vehicles, you know, people think, oh, the whole world's going to go EV and, you know, they will end up buying, uh, they will end up buying all the supply of stock available in the market for particular companies like, you know, mining companies that mine nickel or copper or whatever, or it could be EV vehicle companies. You see, like, I think Ford has doubled over the last six months ish. Uh, Tesla is sixfold. So Tesla has gone up sixfold and it's had its dips as well. And, you know, uh, eventually they will, uh, they will hope for a greater demand at a later time when, when the EV revolution finally happens, which is actually happening right now. So, um, and of course you've got, you know, a, an oversupply due to incorrect demand forecast. So like oil in 2020, uh, in April, 2020. So they didn't expect a pandemic to happen and they kept producing their millions of barrels a day. And it kept going during the, you know, the, the phase where people were skeptical about lockdowns. Will it happen? It's going to happen. It's not going to happen. And consequently, you know, when lockdowns did happen a month in, when uh, there was too much oil, they had, you, they had all these millions of barrels spare, uh, they didn't know what to do with it. So in America, you had the uh, oil futures going negative. People are like, just take the future contract off us and, you know, we'll pay you for it because we got nowhere to store this oil. So these are some of the cases or some of the reasons why a crash or a correction might occur. Basically, a correction is anything around 10%. A crash is something like 30, 40, 50% where people panic. Um, and of course, while majority of the time assets do appreciate, you know, you've had an 11-year, 12-year bull run from 2009, 2010, all the way until 2020. And you had uh, the bull run before then, which is somewhere around 2000, the depths of 2000, which is the depths of the dot-com bubble all the way to 2008. So while majority of the time, you know, 60, 70% of the time, you see them incrementally uh, uh, increase in value, you, you best prepare for when they don't anymore. You know, it might be the, the, the time that you retire. If people retired in, in March of 2020, you know, they would look at their pension. It would be worth half of what it was just, uh, just a month ago or even like two months ago. 
So you've got to prepare for these times and, you know, hedge accordingly. You've got to find the right assets that can help you uh, maintain your maintain value in your portfolio while the whole world is coming crumbling, so to speak. Right. So and you got to keep in mind that, you know, it's usually a very swift motion down as opposed to going up. As I said, you know, stocks will only, I mean, assets will only incrementally go up, whereas a downward movement is much more rapid. It's usually weeks or months. Uh, the March crash of 2020 was literally like five weeks, six weeks, and then you were from the top to the bottom. Uh, and the, the crash of uh, the, the, the financial crisis, were, 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 or so to speak, which was back in uh, 2008, was about 18 months or, you know, 15 months. And then you had the dot-com bubble before then, which was about, again, uh, you know, 15 to 18 months. Uh, whereas the movement upwards is, is, the, is a period in between. It's over years. You know, you got 2010 to 2020, you got uh, 2000 to 2008 and 1990s to roughly, you know, 2000s. So this is pr the, the, the massive drop is primarily because of, you know, the fight flight response that traders have. They see a 1% a, a drop in their holdings or a 5% drop in their holdings and they need to liquidate uh, either because of contractual, you know, reasons. They, they will promise their clients that they won't lose more than 5% so they need to liquidate based on that purpose. Or it's just that they have a fear of themselves that, you know, they, they think it's going to crash further and they just, you know, get out of everything, convert to cash in the hopes of buying the dip uh, maybe in a day, in a week's time at, at a lower cost. So they can, you know, go, uh, go on and reduce their own cost basis while they're at it. And of course, the, the whole idea of globalization, the cohesion of various countries working together has only accelerated these drops. So you can see in 2008, which was, which was a very American issue because of the whole mortgage crisis, because of globalization, the whole world's economy almost came crumbling down. While the problem was brewing in, in America's mortgage uh, uh, mortgage uh, industry, so to speak, or in their bonds, uh, other countries which followed an identical model also came crumbling down, though they're completely independent um, countries, so to speak, but not independent financial um, regulations or financial objectives or you know guidelines you know that they are somewhat related to some extent and of course in some cases greed has resulted in losses lasting decades so you know the greed is often referred to as a bubble after the crashes occur so you got the nikkei in the 1990s which is the japanese stock market people just kept throwing money at japan thinking it's the next big economy it's going to take over europe i think europe was the was the powerhouse just before then uh, and this was in america the american economy was still in somewhat its infancy uh, so to speak, uh, you know, people just kept throwing money at, at Japan or, or in Japan's economy and uh, people, you know, there were too many middlemen in there. Eventually it all came crumbling down. And now Japan is one of those countries which are actually fighting deflation, you know, where the government is keeping the economy propped up based on the their liberal uh, money printing, so to speak. And of course, you had the dot-com bubble. So everybody thinks, oh, Microsoft's a huge company. They've been around for decades. But if you look at the, the chart of just Microsoft, you will see that after they crashed in around 2000, uh, they didn't recover until about 15-ish years later. They weren't back up to that 2000 level until I think it was 2015 or something. I may be completely wrong, but I know it was years before Microsoft could recover uh, its previous highs from the dot com dot com bubble, you know, and uh, I think same with Apple, one of the most you know valuable companies on this planet, has been on the brink of bankruptcy at least twice, I believe. I think it was something somewhere around three times, but I think it's at least twice, you know. So uh, there are all all these factors that that lead up to asset inflation. And uh, sometimes it does come crumbling down. Sometimes, you know, it's based on solid ground, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work out really well. And you've got to keep in mind that you can't time the market. You can only make decisions uh, to the best of your own abilities at that particular moment in time. You know, if I ask you, what's the stock market going to do tomorrow, day after, one year, 10 years from now, you literally, nobody has a clue about what's going to happen. And I keep, you know, drilling this down over and over again. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. Um, so it's quite useless, you know, just, uh, you know, waiting for a market correction because people have been, you know, waiting since 2009. They think it's, it's all a bubble since 2009. They think there was a more downward movement to go since 2009. And, you know, it's just falsely propped up. Same with March 2020, you know, people kept assuming it's going to keep going down or kept hoping it's going to keep going down and they never got in with any skin in the game. And they have since lost out, you know, the market's up almost 50, 60% since then, you know, so 
so you, you you can't wait to the sidelines and you can't wait for a correction and even if you do manage to you know invest exactly at the peak every single time in the last uh, 30 40 years history has shown it's not that bad to be honest i'm, I'm going to show you a graph on the next slide which tries to sum up what i'm trying to say but you know just keep in mind that you can't time the market no matter how good you are no matter what anybody says no matter what signals anybody is seeing on a screen i think it's all gibberish anyways um, you know the chart reading and stuff is something i don't believe in personally but uh, yeah you, you just keep in mind you can't time a market and there's no point you know being on the sideline watching the world go by or watching you know assets in inflate as as you hold your cash under your mattress which is actually decreasing in value right so uh, this is actually a picture i nicked from the website uh, banker on fire which is one of my references i, I often refer to um in this particular case some random dude tried to working in the 1970s and every single time he he reached a substantial sum or every single time the market was so rampant that everybody was talking about it he decided to invest so you know back in 1972 at the start of his career he invested about 6 grand of his savings it went on there was a little bit of crash you know and 1987 was the next time everyone was talking about stock market they're talking about oh you got to get in bro it's you know uh, it is the it is the, it's the next biggest thing whatever so he decided to put the savings he made between the 87 and 72 about 15 years worth which is about 46 grand uh considering inflation and stuff like that you know so he he put in 46 grand at that time and there was a bit of a crash but since then it's gone up and then next thing you know everybody's talking about it again in the 90 in the in the late to in the early 2000s the dot com bubble and you know that's where he puts in the the money he's made between 2000 and 1987 about 13 years worth of savings about 68 grand and then you have your dot com bubble crashing coming down again um and again you know the, the just before the financial crisis everybody was talking about this the stock market you got to get in uh, there's big money to be made he make he puts his uh, his savings once again uh i think it's about a seven year period of his savings 64 grand and then there's a huge crash over over 15 months but he keeps holding on in this hypothetical scenario and look at that in 2018 ish 2019 ish he's looking at roughly 800 grand uh what of uh, his portfolio is worth about 800 grand on a cumulative of roughly let's put it at i don't know uh 100 and 170 grand 180 grand he's forexed his entire portfolio just by holding his nerve and trying to you know and this guy's invested at every peak he's not timed the bottom if you know if you uh pick up several strategies that we'll talk about in a bit obviously you can do much better than him but this is like the worst case scenario this is you investing at every peak there's always another peak later on i think people in feb were like this is people in feb 2020 said this was this is the top there was a little crash people you know ran, people got a bit uh, panicked about it and we're back again you know april 2021 we're at a peak again and we are beating that peak i think uh, today was a higher peak than what was around 2 days ago So two days ago was when uh, the uh, sorry, sorry last week was when the S&P hit 4000 points for the first time uh, and today it's 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 going even higher so you know the assets or or the market in general tend to inflate with time um, and these are all assets you know you got housing stocks um, you know uh, other valuable assets some vehicles i guess uh, and other things you may consider crypto for example is is another asset that, you know is appreciating over time right so uh the graph opposite shows the performance of several um asset classes over the year 2000 so that's the that's january 2000 right there that's the starting point you know 0% gain 0% movement since and we're looking at december 2010 right over here so the performance of various categories is varying between just below minus 20% about minus 25% to a positive 20% ish so that's a, that's the variety of performance of different asset classes over the year 2020 you can see like commodities take a huge drop like 50% i think it's mostly driven by by oil because oil comprises of a large portion of commodity portfolios and it's recovered since its bottom to about half it's basically recovered 50% since its bottom and of course you, you remember the whole us stocks the purple line dropping significantly minus 20% in this case i think i think some some uh, indexes were even lower ending the year from a neg- uh, ending the year from a ne- bottom of a negative 20% to a positive 20% that's a 40% growth over 
you know, six months in this case, or sorry, two, uh, nine months in this case. And some of the stocks, uh, you know, world stocks, for example, took an even deep, bigger hit. As I said, you know, some, some stocks took a big hit and they ended up the year with a positive 10%. So since you cannot actually pick out what's going to happen in the future, you know, how do you know what's going to be, if, if the NASDAQ is going to do better, the tech stocks, financial stocks, bank stocks or whatever, uh, since you can't pick out what's going to work out in the future, I think if, if you're not that um, interested in actively managing your portfolio, then it's best to try to diversify across a range of these products, you know, uh, in, in uh, quantities that you feel suitable for your risk tolerance uh, to be able to get some sort of performance over your own portfolio so that if you can't beat the market with active management, the least you can do is match it, which, you know, the S&P has been roughly 11% per annum over the past 11 or 12 years. So the best result is just trying to diversify across a range of uh, instruments available to yourself. And we've discussed this uh, in previous episodes. Uh, this is another graph which actually shows uh, the discrete performance of different categories over uh, the last you know, 10 years, as well as a cumulative performance uh, aggregating over that 10 year period. Again, this is coming from bankers on uh, Banker on Wheels. Uh, so he sh he's identified uh, these numbers based on these ETFs. You know, they're all American available ETFs. Uh, they're not available in the UK because of the UCITS rule. The UC, it's like a, a, a financial regulation that does not allow all American ETFs to be listed here. So, you know, European ETFs have a different regulation to follow. Hence, you can't find any of these on the, on the European markets, but you can find European equivalents. So, you know, for the S&P, he's used SPY, something we often refer to. The QQQ is an, is an ETF tracking the NASDAQ, which is the orange one there. Uh, I know TLT is a bond ETF. I know, uh, what else do I know from here? I think uh, that's all I can think of, to be honest. That's all I can recognize in that list down there. I think may maybe AGG is gold, I'm not sure. Anyway, I might be completely wrong with that one, but by all means, you know, look up these stickers, see what they mean. And you've got uh, gold, US REITs are basically uh, investing in real estate via investment trusts or ETFs. So think of uh, REITs as an ETF version of real estate. They will take your money and they will invest it in various uh, real estate projects across the US in this particular case. But you get REITs for the UK, REITs for, the, for, for Europe, REITs for the world, and they're, you know, on the website of the provider, I'll tell you exactly where they're investing your money in commercial, retail, uh, you know, residential, so on and so forth, development or whatever, you know. So you've got that, you've got NASDAQ, which is basically tech stocks, emerging market is China, India, Brazil, that kind of stuff. You've got dividend stocks, S&P. Uh, I think corporates means corporate bonds, treasuries is government bonds. Uh, developed markets is everything except for the U.S., I believe, or or maybe it's it's a bunch of countries that exclude the U.S. and a few other countries uh, entirely. So based on a, on a U.S. standpoint, they look at developed markets separately because their home market is so strong. They don't look much towards Europe or Australia or Japanese, um, you know, markets, so to speak. So they, they classify it separately. Uh, and then bonds, I believe, might just be different kind of bonds. I'm not sure. And inflation bonds are bonds which um, actually in increase in value with inflation. So with these bonds, uh, they lose value with inflation, but these ones are to keep up. So you will, you know, you will make a very small percentage gain, but the minimum you will make is roughly around inflation, whereas that's not guaranteed in these kind of bonds. I'm, I'm not sure how they work. I'm not that first. I don't touch bonds very often. But you can see that, you know, every single year, something else has been on top. I mean, tech has been really strong over the past decade, but that's not guaranteed to grow. You know, you've got U.S. REITs. Uh, who knew real estate would be the next best thing in 2014, so to speak, you know? Uh, but you can see the wild variety. You have to pick, if you want to, you know, actively invest, you have to pick what the next year's uh, top performer is going to be or top three or top five performer is going to be. Um, so, you know, it's best to try to pick uh, or best try to diversify across them uh, as you feel suitable. So over, over the course of 10 years, that's the aggregate, not the, the aggregate cumulative performance. That's what you would have earned per annum, roughly 17 or roughly 18% on the NASDAQ per, per annum, uh, compounded over 10 years, of course, and then roughly 13% on the S&P and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, rather than trying to predict the future, it's kind of best, you know, to try to hedge or to, uh, you know, balance out your portfolio so that you have equal or roughly uh, relevant exposure to whatever your risk tolerance is, or you feel it is at least. 
Uh, additionally, you know, as I said, you don't have to invest every peak when everybody's talking about the stock market. You can also begin to uh, mitigate your risk a little bit by dripping, uh, you know, your funds and your investments. So in my particular case, I, I drop in a, a small fraction every week because I don't have any uh, brokerage costs nor any buying or selling costs associated with my particular instruments. So by choosing to purchase over time, you can average down uh, the cost, the unit cost of your uh, instrument in a falling market, for example. So if you if you kept putting money in over the March crash, you would actually, you know, bring your average cost per unit down, even though you had held uh, a few units before the March crash itself. So, you know, you're not suffering a significant drop uh, as opposed to a lump sum investment made at the wrong time. So if you invested... Uh, you know, sometime in late Feb, just before the crash, and you, you know, you're looking at your portfolio in April, you, you will be crying looking at a, a negative 40% over, over a little over a month. Uh, whereas, of course, those people who did that are, are much, much uh, happier, I hope, now, you know, a year from that day, uh, when, they're, when they're up roughly 10 to 12% or even, you know, 15% since last Feb. And of course, dollar cost averaging has the advantage of you being able to ramp up or down your funding into your instruments, depending on circumstance. So, you know, one month, if, if the market has been super strong, you can invest less, for example, thinking, oh, there might be a crash coming around uh, or there might be a correction next month. So maybe I'll put in, you know, 75 quid uh, this month and 125 next month and so on and so forth. This also allows you to have cash reserves to deploy in dire times, you know, so if your nerves allow you, if you don't, if you can overcome your fear, having cash in March 2020 was a very powerful thing. You could, you know, deploy that crash, that cash in dire times like that into valuable instruments, either, you know, large cap companies like Apple or Microsoft independently, or uh, an ETF that tracks the market like that, that, like SPY, you know, trying to find those corrections or having cash just happening to have it just by chance. Uh, based on a strategy, you know, having cash at a time like that, when there's a minus 10%, minus 5% correction and deploying it at that particular moment, you know, puts you leaps ahead of, of not, not partaking at all. Or, or um, um, having said that, you know, back testing, which is basically using uh, previous data shows that in roughly th in more than three quarter cases, lump sum investments have almost always outperformed dollar cost averaging when the investing period is over five years. So having made, you know, having said all that, this is one way of doing things, but, you know, having a lump sum 10 grand just put in the stock market as, a, as, the, as the person in the example did uh, previously uh, shows that it's, it's better off than doing uh, better off than, uh, you know, trying to dollar cost average over if your investment horizon is, is greater than five years. Of course, the longer your investment horizon, the, the lower your chances of making a loss. And that chance actually goes to roughly like zero point something percent or roughly zero percent after I think seven years or so. There's like a, there's like a almost zero percent chance you lose money in the market over a seven year investment horizon uh, considering what's happened so far. Of course, this doesn't take into consideration transaction costs from a broker or, or any buying and selling fees or anything like that, or any entry or exit charges that may be uh, implied on you, which may mitigate any advantage of dollar cost averaging, in which case lump sum is the way to go. Uh, but yeah, I think that's that's all I have for today. I just wanted to remind that there's always going to be a crash. Don't panic. Uh, the point isn't to avoid or you know be risk averse. The point is to take risk in, in, in doses that is acceptable to yourself or you think is acceptable to yourself. So don't be afraid to lose money out there because everybody's going to lose money out there. But as long as you're being patient and you know, you're, uh, you, you're calming your nerves uh, in dire times, I think you will come out much, much better on the other side. So I think Peter Lynch uh, said that uh, when, like far more money has been lost by investors trying to prepare for corrections or trying to anticipate them then has actually been lost in the corrections themselves. So uh, put buying, which is a, a form of hedge where you people, you know, people buy puts, which are a little bit out of the money. Uh, they, you know, that's, that's a cost that people try to, or tend to want to bear so that they have downside protection. But a lot of, a lot of these puts may expire worthless. And then, you know, that, that, uh, that money that they threw at puts, if they are rather threw it at SPY instead, uh, they would be much better off, uh, 
looking back, of course, I'm saying this, but if you have one of the lost decades, so to speak, then you got to know what to do uh, or how to handle uh, scenarios like that. Uh, but again, my, my target audience is young people. So hopefully, uh, by all means, you know, put yourselves out there, see, see what works out and, you know, make a strategy, have a plan and, and invest according to that. Um, but yeah, by all means, there are references out there. I took my my uh, screen, my my pictures from Bank on Wheels. Uh, that's that's really great for passive investing. For active investing, you've got the bottom half of uh, of the, the references slide. The top half focuses mostly on passive stuff. Um, and yeah, if if you if you have any questions, if you want to discuss anything, if you want any ideas, by all means, catch me in person or on social or leave a YouTube comment if you feel like it. And I'd recommend, you know, by all means, watch these episodes over if you need help. Um, and if you still have questions, then I, I'm more than happy to help out uh, to the best of my abilities. And of course, my my biased opinion. Again, uh, thank you for your time. Today was a quick one. And uh, I don't have any plans for future episodes, but I've got a few ideas that I might put into work. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but for now, I think this is, the, this is the last one for a while to come. So thank you for, you know, tuning in live for whoever it who did and stuck by by or stuck around and um, yeah i hope you've you've learned something over these eight episodes which have occurred over three four weeks and um, yeah if you've got any questions by all means shoot them across uh thank you and have have a great uh, evening and a good night folks yep <laughs>